we're fortunate to have Kent Williams uh, join us. Um, I know he's visited several clubs in the area, and we've yeah. we've had a um, been fortunate enough to have him visit TVBA for the past couple of years. He's a, a Eastern Apiculture Society Master Beekeeper, which is quite an accomplishment. A past president of the Eastern Apiculture Society and the Lake um, Lake Barkley Beekeepers Association, I believe. He has a the what he tells us is the Lake Barkley Bee School, but we know it as the Kent Williams Bee School. Um, most years in March, but I think uh, COVID-19 has knocked that out this year. So we're glad to, to have him. Uh, I'm not sure how many hives he's running now. I've heard he had um, 800 at one point, but I suspect it's more. But um, anyway, we'll get started. And uh, Kent's style is more or less just re reactive. He likes questions. And um, Kent, I'll, I'll start us off with uh, questions. We had some submitted and we'll interspersed participants questions as we go along. Um, if you could do one thing different since you started beekeeping, one thing in beekeeping different, what would it be? I would have started younger. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the short answer to that. Uh, I don't know, the one, the one thing different, um, Maybe I would have focused a little bit more on a particular area of beekeeping rather than trying to do everything and trying to be a one-man band. I would have probably focused more and got uh, got more involved in uh, in cross-country pollination earlier in my beekeeping career rather than wait. And I've, I mean, I've I've done okay. I don't have any complaints and how my business has played out over the years. But uh, I can see that it would have been, it would have been to my advantage to have uh, focused more on the, on the business side of it once I learned how to keep bees alive and how to make more bees. Once I learned how to grow bees, I probably should have focused more on the business side of it. But, I, I really don't have any complaints. Great. Um, here's a question. Uh, the Tennessee uh, Beekeepers Association has had uh, Dr. Leo Sharashkin as a speaker the past couple of years. Um, do you have any experience with horizontal hives? And if so, what has been your experience with them? I've had experience with different types of horizontal hives, and uh, some of them, some of them work pretty well, and some of them I've just not had that much success with, and that may be more because of me rather than the, the actual hive. But uh, what I've found with horizontal hive hives is that they're a lot more labor intensive than a Langstroth hive. You can't just put another box on, and uh, get more honey flow. You have to start removing frames of honey if you're going to uh, maximize your honey crop. And I experimented uh, 25 years ago, I guess, with, uh, at that time it was called a Russian coffin hive. And now they're just the, the long, long hives, long Langstroth or whatever. I don't know, there's several terms for them. But, uh, they accepted uh, they accepted a Langstroth deep frame, and the actual Russian hives, they their frames were just all over the place. They were all, everything was homemade, so one one hive's frames wouldn't fit another hive. But uh, with the Langstroth frames, you could use those in a coffin style hive, and then maybe the hive might be uh, six feet long, seven feet long and entrance on both end and the tip, typical Russian hive, it had a follower board that you could put in there to block, to, to cut it in half for that the bees could not travel from one end to the other. And uh, the management that made the thing work was that uh, 
you would use it like a use the follower board like you would a double screen, only it was less labor involved in it because you were leaving the queen on one end of the hive and putting bees and brood on the other end and uh, letting them raise a new queen. Each end had its own entrance and let them raise a new queen. And uh, so you'd have essentially a, a two queen hive and that's how they typically how they requeen their hives years ago in Russia. And because they didn't have the industry there that we do as far as a beekeeping uh, support system. But uh, uh, it worked pretty good for that purpose. But as far as honey production, uh, the coffin hives were unhandy, I guess would be the best way to say it. And top bar hives, uh, I had trouble with comb melting out of the top bar hives and it probably was something I was doing wrong but the, the tender comb would wind up just in a mess in the bottom of the hive and it, it was it was probably my fault but uh, I was not very attentive to them because I had a lot of other Langstroth hives that I was having to manage at the same time and they were kind of a novelty to me and Another beekeeper gave them to me and they didn't want to hurt his feelings, so I put some bees in them. And uh, they were interesting to say the least, but I never could make the top bar hive work to suit me. But the coffin hive, I could. Uh, it, it worked okay. It was just labor intensive to keep the honey out because they get honey bound just in a, in a flash when, they, when a big honey crop, honey flow came. And you had to keep the honey away from them. But uh, yeah, I've had, I don't have anything bad to say about the uh, horizontal hives. Um, it's just that they don't suit the type of beekeeping that I do. They don't lend themselves well to moving across country and to moving to honey flows. Where I live is if you wanna, if you wanna make a living making honey with your bees, you have to move the bees to the honey flows. And the long hives don't, uh, don't lend themselves well to that. Do you, uh, a follow up here is what proportion of your inventory, I guess there's, as she's referring to, uh, would be the horizontal hives. Um, do you currently run any of those or what you're talking no, about? I, I don't, uh, I have some, but they don't have bees in them. I mean, I, I have them just for demonstration for people that come here to show them what the hive looks like and how you would set it up. If you, because we have people come here that that's what they want to know. They, they want to know. How would I set up a top bar hive? How would I set up a long Langstroth hive? And I have some here just for demonstration, but I usually don't keep bees in them. Once in a while, I'll catch a swarm and put it in one, but uh, I'm usually not quite that bored. <laughs> you mentioned the Russian coffin hives. Um, and do you have any experience with Russian bees? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, when uh, USDA started with the Russian bees, um, I kind of got into it a little bit, sort of midstream, and uh, I raised, I had some pure Russian yards. I didn't work with USDA at all, but uh, I did have some pure Russian yards and evaluated the Russian bees in uh, 2002, 3, and 4, and 5. And uh, out of those, out of those years, there was one year in particular that the Russians were really good. I really liked them. And I actually kept stock from that particular year and uh, raised queens off of them. And I still have some queens that look a little bit like them, but they're not Russian at all. They just have that look, have the look of that particular queen. And the Russians would be a different color every year, it seemed like. And one year they were really nasty to work, and they discontinued that year. That was, that was the, they discontinued that cross. But the, the other cross is the, the other three years that I had Russian, uh, they, they weren't terribly productive where I live because it seemed like they were just, just a little out of sync with the honey flow with their brood production because when the honey flow would stop, the queen would stop. And she wouldn't start again until the honey flow started again. Well, then by the time the hive brooded up, the honey flow would stop again. And they seemed to be just a little bit out of sync. But uh, I moved the Russian bees that I had when I quit raising Russian 
want to quit with a pure rushing yards. Uh, I kind of filtered those into the bees we had in Mississippi, and they actually worked really well in Mississippi. Uh, I mean, you think of a Russian bee as being a northern bee, but really the Russian bees work best where there's a, a steady honey flow, where there's kind of a slow buildup that gets the queen started and the honey flow don't quit for quite a while. And they work really well then. In, in Mississippi, they have a good honey flow from mid-March until mid-June, sometimes a little bit later, and then it quits and everything pretty much just scorches. But when it quits, the bees quit and they don't, they're not like Italians. They don't eat up everything that they've produced. So I actually would make more honey with Russians than I would with Italians in Mississippi. But it was just exactly the opposite in West Kentucky. So, you know, I, Russians are good bees in the right place. They're good bees anyway, but uh, they work better in the right place. And it's all about the honey flow, honey and pollen flow with Russians. Some of them were pretty ill, ill-tempered, but there were, there was at least two years out of the four that I raised them that uh, they weren't that bad to work. They were okay. They're pretty nice bees. Great. All right. Does anyone have a question for Kent? I have a list of them here. Yeah, Did I hear some? Go ahead. This is Howard Kerr. Again, I got a question for you. All right, Howard. Uh, good to see you. Um, how's a, what is your recommendation for people to treat as far as when the honey flow is over, what is your recommendation for treatment for Varroa? For Varroa? Yeah. Uh, well, if the weather is hot, I'd rather not use formic acid unless you just use a flash treatment with it. You can use a flash treatment, like a two-day treatment, just to knock the mites down, and that works pretty good with formic, and it usually you usually don't lose much brood. It don't sterilize queen, or it don't hurt the queens as bad. But uh, uh, in the summertime, for, with formic, with a flash treatment with formic, you can use that uh, with honey super zone. But, Thymol, a thymol treatment works really good in the summer, uh, but uh, you don't need honey supers on. So after your honey flow, when you take your honey supers off, you can use thymol and it works pretty good. But main thing uh, that I recommend for treating with mites, treating mites, is that uh, not to use the same thing two times in a row. Treat for mites at least twice a year and three times is not too much but use three different things yeah. Yeah. so that uh, you're not exposing the same, the same uh, genetic code of mites to the same chemical over and over and over. And I don't know, may, maybe, it, uh, maybe it helps some by keeping them from developing a tolerance to the chemical, maybe not, but it makes me feel better anyway. But in, in the spring, I, I like to use thymol once, and formic acid once, and uh, depending on if there's any cap brood in the hive, if there's cap brood in the hive, I don't use oxalic because uh, oxalic is it's really good if there's no cap brood in the hive, but it don't do anything to the mites under the capping. And even if you come back and treat once a week for three weeks, you're not getting any residual effect from the oxalic. So all the mites that come out from under the cappings for six and a half days, uh, they're still spreading viruses in the hive. So we're, we're actually pretty good at killing mites. We got a lot of stuff that works fairly well on mites, but it's the viruses that they transmit into the hive that give us the, the real problems. And uh, the key is getting as, as much of a total kill on the mites as possible. And if you don't have any cap brood in the hive, and you, you can you can manage that by uh, caging the queen, and you know you can you can kind of manipulate that if you don't have a lot of hives to fool with. But if you don't have any cap brood in the hive, oxalic is a great treatment, and that's good treatment going into the fall or in the middle of the summer. 
for that matter. But uh, I like to use three different things. Uh, for instance, uh, thymol, thymol in the in the early spring, and then uh, which I, I most of the time I, I use Apple Life Bar or Apple Guard, one of the two, and uh, then Formic in the summer, just as a flash treatment, and then in the fall either oxalic or or Apple Bar, which is uh, Amitraz. Amitraz, if I hadn't if I haven't gotten a good kill on the mites in the spring and summer, I'll use Amitraz in the fall because it's pretty harsh and it, it will kill the mites most, most of the time. Uh, but if, if I've gotten a pretty good kill spring and summer, then I'll use oxalic in the fall. I'll break the brood cycle and use oxalic in the fall. And uh, that's, that's just what I recommend to people. I, I try to use the least toxic things that I can, but uh, when it comes down to it, I want to put something in there to kill mites. If there's mites in there, I want to kill them. Super. Super. I had a question here. If you make a split, how do you keep the bees from leaving? The main thing, when you're making a split, you want to make sure you have uncapped brood larva in that split bees are more likely to stay with larva than they are pupa they they don't have any they don't have any uh uh i guess you would say fidelity they, you know, they, they don't care about pupa at all and that's why that's why when you have brood that chills it's always pupa they'll they'll keep larva covered in cool nights but they'll leave the pupa alone and uh so if, if you put larva frames of frames that have larva on them in your split, the bees are a lot more likely to stay. Also, uh, young bees are a lot more likely to stay on the frame that you put in in the split compared to old bees. Foragers they're used to flying. They're used to getting out and flying, going where they want to, and it, it's uh, sometimes it's a little tricky to get foragers to stay in a hive. Uh, once you make a split with them, if you got a bunch of foragers, which is one thing about packages, if you get a package that was shook real late in the day and uh, has a high percentage of foragers in it, when you dump the package in, they may stay and they may not. They're foragers. I mean, they they don't care nothing about making a new home in there. But the uh, same way with your split, young bees and uh, uncapped brood will go a long way toward uh, keeping bees in the hive. Super. Uh, from our Chip. chat box, does, do you have any particular technique for maximizing your honey harvest? Well, uh, keep in mind that it takes two to three times as much comb area to cure the honey, to cure the nectar, as it does to store the honey that's produced from the nectar. So you're gonna need at least twice as much comb, twice as many supers on the hive as you expect to get honey. If you open a hive up and you got burr comb against the inner cover and it's got honey in it, you probably missed at least a super of honey, maybe more. It, it's okay to open a hive up and there be an empty super in the top or that you can tell that there had been honey in it. That's where they cured the nectar. So make sure that they got plenty of room, way more room than you think they're gonna need because it takes that room, they scatter that nectar out in little droplets and then consolidate it once it begins to cure. And make sure they got at least twice as much room as you think that, that they need. And that's one way that you'll maximize your honey crop. But uh, other than that, you gotta have healthy bees, you gotta have a productive queen, you got to keep the queen laying. Don't ever let her stop. Once she starts laying in the spring, don't ever let her stop laying. If you have to feed her, feed her. If it takes a pollen sub to, to keep protein in the hive, uh, whatever it takes, keep that queen laying if you can at all. If the queen quits laying and won't start back when you feed her, get another one. Because a, a $20 queen or $25 queen, uh, that's not but four or five pounds of honey. So 
it, it's your money ahead by getting another queen and putting her in there rather than letting one just kind of limp along through the summer and costing you a lot of honey honey production. But uh, main thing is just healthy hive, good queen, and plenty of room. Super. I believe Jay has his one had a question. All right. Hey, Ken. Hello, Jay. The meeting up at your place for your class. Yeah. Up at my place? Yeah. When are you going to do the next class up at your place? I always miss it every year. <laughs> well, we were, we were going to do it the 9th, 10th, and 11th of April this year. But uh, uh, the powers that be decided that we weren't going to do it. <laughs> 10th and 11th. <laughs> yeah, that was the honey convention and everything got screwed up this year. I know. You know I, I tell people that uh, I've lived in Cuba all my life, but I never, I never identified much with the, the plight of the actual Cuban Islanders until now. <laughs> you know, I, I feel kind of put upon. But uh, the next class, I'm, we're considering having a class in the fall, probably in September. Uh, and it, it will just be a either a one or two day thing. And it'll be kind of a miniature of what we do in April. And we'll still do queen rearing and hands-on stuff, hive inspections, things like that. But uh, September, we'll still have a lot of bees here on the farm. So it'd be a good time, good time to come. But if, uh, just keep watching the Lake Barkley Facebook page. And it'll have, it'll have something on it when we're going to have it. And we'll eat. Thanks. We'll also eat. That's the main thing. Always gotta eat. Do we have another question for Ken? Hey, this is Stuart Ledford. Yeah. Good to see you, Kent. You Looking too, good. Sir. Yeah, man. I had something happen this year I've never seen before. I think I know what it is. Um, had good splits this year. I knew this queen, put her in a nook, felt good about our resources and didn't pay any attention. Came back later um, to put her in a regular hive and build her up a little bit. And I, I witnessed some robin, but once I got in there, the eggs were black and dry and it looked like some aggressive behavior on the cat brood like they were pulling out pupa and I assumed it was Robin but I've never seen black eggs and that was kind of alarming uh, I didn't see any breakdown so this is not larva it was the actual egg was black and dry yeah well, that that's unusual to see a black egg I mean it could be a fungus causing that um, it, it was a whole be, frame of them. It could it could be associated with black queen cell virus also. Uh, <laughs> it, could, it could be kind of an offshoot of that. Uh, but, I mean, that affected the egg stage instead of the pupil stage, and it wasn't in a queen cell. It was in eggs, but you just don't usually see black larva or, you know, the if it's black larva, it, it's really dried out, you know, and then Maybe that's what happened to the eggs. Maybe they died and, and the bees didn't cover them and they died and got really dry and the bees didn't remove them. For some reason, they, they should have been removing those eggs. That's what would, uh, that's what would kind of uh, make me wonder what was going on if they were not removing those eggs. And, but they were trying to maybe remove the pupa. I don't know. There, there's something going on there that... Uh, I mean, the catch-all now is you say, well, that was a virus. <laughs> that, that's real comforting, you know. Uh, how do you recognize it? Well, you got black eggs and the bees are removing them. <laughs> but, uh, well, I didn't know if uh, robbers got aggressive and attacked, you know, more than stole the resources if they attacked the brood cycle. I didn't know. Sometimes they do, yeah. Some Sometimes uh, – bees will get really aggressive like that and it's not common i mean what what you saw was something really out of the ordinary okay thank but, you sir uh, uh, that gives me something to ask people when when i talk to when i talk to people that that i go to for, with questions uh, I'm, I'm always looking for something 
that will uh, keep them awake at night, you know. <laughs> That's a good one then. Thank you, sir. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. Great. Our chat box is filling up here, so let's hit a few questions from the chat box. Um, what proportion of your income is from bee sales, honey sales, and commercial leasing? I guess that's pollination. I'm not sure. Pollination, yeah. Um, well, we make, um, and God, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't really have any secrets about any, anything that we do, but, uh, we spend, we, we make roughly $150 per colony from pollination each year. And I mean, that's the profit margin is about $150 per colony. Then when the bees come back from California, we make another $150 per colony selling bees, selling nukes and packages off of those bees that come back from almond pollination. And uh, we also make roughly the same amount from honey production. So at, as uh, you know, the simplest way to put it is, it's, just, it's, it's, it's pretty close to a one third split. We make about one third of our, of our income from live bee sales. The one thing that we make less income from than, than any other part of beekeeping is queen sales. Uh, sales. Uh, raising queens and selling queens, it, it takes so many resources for mating nukes that uh, that's the least profitable thing that we do. But uh, about one third each is uh, how we do it. But until we started sending bees to almonds, it wasn't that way uh, because watermelon pollination don't pay nearly as much as almond. Does. So, you know, when we were just pollinating almonds, we made about uh, uh, maybe less than a fourth of our income from pollination and the rest of it was divided evenly between bee sales and, and honey. Yes, but you had our undying admiration for pollinating watermelons, I tell you. <laughs> okay have you had any experience with the mighty might um uh, heat treatment mighty um, might heat treatment for varroa talking about that uh, thermal the thermal grid yeah. that you put in i've not had a lot of experience with it i've never used one myself but um uh, uh i've talked with zachary huang about that quite a bit we we talked a lot about it and um the difference in temperature of what it takes to kill a mite and and when you start killing bees is fairly fairly small but you know you have to get up to a certain temperature to kill the mite but it can't get over that or you're going to start melting melting stuff in the hive and uh, and killing a few bees too and it will work it i mean it's not just theory it is it is fact and the reason i've talked with zachary so much about it the mighty might thing was built on uh, on research that he did and the first the first thing that he did was he had uh, he had a heat strip across the front door of the hive and when bees would go through this heat strip to get in the hive it would heat the mites up and it would it would knock the mites off the bees and it would kill most of them, but some of them, it, because he couldn't keep it hot enough, but without scorching the bees. And uh, so I knew that he had quite a bit of experience working with this. And uh, he said that he, he said it would work. And it wasn't just theory that it would work, but the conditions have to be absolutely perfect for it to work well that it, it's almost like uh, small hive beetle traps. You know, they'll work, but do they catch all the beetles? No, not at all. They, they don't catch all the beetles by a long shot. And so that's, that's the, what little experience I've had has been kind of uh, uh, secondary, I guess you would say, uh, talking with people and going to people's bee yards and checking their bees for mites after they've had these mite pads on, 
are these mite grid zones, and they still have mites, just not not nearly as many. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of when screen bottom boards first got popular. You know, uh, screen bottom board is going to be the uh, savior, you know, for varroa killing all the varroa mites. But uh, as it turned out, there's about a 20% difference with a screen bottom board compared to a solid bottom. So at the mite grids are a little bit better than a screen bottom board, but they're not they're not a silver bullet. And if you got if you got a hundred hives, they're definitely not cost effective to use. Understood. <laughs> you mentioned small hive beetles. We had a question submitted from a member. What do you recommend for small hive beetles? And does diametaceous earth work in the beetle traps? Diametaceous earth will work in a beetle trap. Uh, crushed limestone will work in a beetle trap. Neither one of them work as fast as uh, food grade mineral oil that works that works quicker and better in a beetle trap but your hive needs to be level especially if you have one of the west traps that fit on the bottom of the hive all the way across the bottom of the hive both of it will work uh, any of the traps though the bees the bees have to be aggressive toward the mites and drive the mites into the traps uh, the mites very seldom just run and get into the trap just by themselves, they have to be harassed before that uh, the traps are very effective. And there again, you know, the traps are not going to catch all the beetles. You're still going to have beetles in hives. Uh, it, it's it's awful to say, but uh, the most effective beetle traps are the ones that aren't legal. So you know that that's all I'll say about that. Understood. But, uh, <laughs> uh, clean right hive. Keep keep your hive clean right, and and put some kind of ground treatment on to keep beetles from coming back out of the ground and and going back into you know keep new beetles, new generations from coming out of the ground. Uh, we don't really have that much problem with our bees with beetles because we move our bees a lot. If you move your bees two or three times a year. A couple of times a year, uh, you won't have that big of a problem with beetles because you're leaving the problem in the ground where they were. And uh, that first flush of beetles, if you keep your hives clean right, that first flush of beetles very seldom destroys a hive. So it, it's those subsequent generations that come out and start laying eggs all at the same time in a hive that do all the damage. And uh, when you move your hive, you leave that behind you. So, you know, if you move your hives, you won't have that big of a deal, but I, I understand that everybody don't move their hives around too. You need something to knock those beetles down, and that's where the ground treatment comes into play. Uh, Dynamaceous earth works for small scale. You can use uh, crushed limestone for a little bit larger scale. You can spray the ground with uh, guard star for an even larger scale, but but anytime you get a lot of ground moisture, like rain, a lot of rain, it's going to leach all of that out. You have to reapply it. So the best treatment for a hive beetle is a hive tool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's see. What are the consequences if the bees start backfilling the brood chamber with nectar at this time of year? Uh, the consequence is supersedure. You'll have a hive that either swarms or supersedes or possibly just absconds. When, when the queen runs out of places to uh, lay eggs, uh, the bees are going to perceive her as being a poor queen, not doing her job, not doing what she's supposed to be doing at, that, at the right time of year. And uh, they're gonna supersede her, even if they don't have anything to supersede her with they'll still try to supersede the queen. They'll, they'll go through with killing her and trying to make a new queen, even if there's not anything they can make one with. It's just, uh, you know, the, the instinct is so strong that they're gonna do that. And making bees stop backfilling the brood nest is just almost impossible. Once they start, they're just going to keep doing it. 
uh, you can you can uh, kind of delay that and hope that the nectar flow runs out before that uh, you run out of room for the queen to lay by putting drawn comb, removing the removing the frames that have a lot of honey in them or nectar, and putting drawn empty drawn comb back in their place. Uh, in in extreme circumstances, if you just cannot make them quit putting nectar in the brood nest, you can put your supers on the bottom and put your brood nest on top of the hive. I mean, that, that sounds uh, crazy, but uh, once the bees get used to dumping the nectar as soon as they come in the front door and putting it right there close to the front door, they're not gonna stop. They're, it's hard to make them stop. And uh, in an extreme circumstance, you, I've, I've done it several times to move the, I mean, just make a backwards hive. And it's crazy, but it's pretty easy to work to find the queen because she's not going to be up in the honey super. You know, she'll, she'll be up at the top. But if they push the queen out of the brood nest up into the honey super, they'll wind up killing her most of the time. Okay. Um, Ruth Ann, did you have a question? People are tired of hearing me. I sure did. Since you're talking about queens and soup procedure, you mentioned a while ago that um, to break the brood cycle and treat for mites, you could cage the queen during that time. But do the bees not misinterpret that and supersede her? You know, there's no brood pheromone, no nothing, I guess. They can, yeah. That That's one uh, downside to it. You have to go back in and cut queen cells out. When you when you cage the queen or when you remove the queen from a hive, you've got to cut queen cells out, or they will make another queen in there. Mm. And that's just uh, that's just part of it. When we when we break the brood cycle in in our hives, uh, the way we do it is we put the queens in three frame nuke with uh, one frame of bees and one frame of food and an empty frame, and uh, we. We leave those queens in the three frame nuke and we go back in a week and cut all the queen cells out, go through the hives, cut all the queen cells out. And uh, all you really have to leave the queen cage, it's about, uh, it, it's the length of time that the bees are in the pupil stage, which is 14 days for a drone, 11 days for a worker. So a week and a half to two weeks is all that you would leave the queen caged and, and then you can put her back in there. And if you do that in the middle of the summer, of course I know it's not easy to find a queen in a big hive in the middle of the summer, but if you do that in the middle of the summer when there's nothing for the bees to be doing anyway, uh, you're not really losing anything and you wind up having a clean hive, uh, clean from mites and uh, new bees when you put the queen back in you know she takes off again and uh, young bees going into the fall so it's, it's kind of a win-win there but it's labor intensive to do that and we don't do that very often with our bees just because it does take so much time to do it it's easier for us to just uh, treat with formic in the in the summer and then come back and and treat with something usually it's it's uh amitraz you know apivar strips or something like that in the fall uh, before we well usually we do that when we're getting ready to send the bees to get ready for almond pollination and how do you do a flash treatment i don't know that terminology well that that's kind of a, a redneck slang for <laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> well, no, I know, coming from me, that's, that's <laughs> out, of, out of character, I know. Right. <laughs> uh, flash treatment is, you're, you're getting a, a lot of the effect from formic acid you get in the first two days that you put the strip in. And you, you can put uh, mine away quick strips in for quick strips in a hive for two days. And uh, you get, you get uh, a pretty good, knocked down of the mites and in the middle of the summer 
I don't, I don't really want anything in the middle of the summer more than just uh, get me over till the end of summer and when we can treat with something good in the fall. And that's what you get with a flash treatment. And the flash treatment is just that. It's just uh, uh, roughly a 25 to 30% treatment of formic acid uh, in length of time that you would leave it in there, about uh, 25 to 30% of the time that you would normally leave it and uh, take it out. And you don't, you don't get the damaged brood and damaged queen like you sometimes do. And you don't get bees flying out and getting in the trees either like you do sometimes with forming in hot weather. And it actually, a flash treatment actually works better in hot weather than it does, uh, than, you know, than it does, would in cool weather. Bruce Ann, uh, Jeff Harrell spoke on that. Uh, I don't know if you remember him when he was at our club last year. Yeah. Okay, um, how did your swarm season go this year? <laughs> and did you see the same early buildup that we had here? Well, we had an excellent swarm season, if you're talking about how many swarms we had. <laughs> uh, we, we repopulated the feral population in our area this year with, with swarms. Uh, we had a lot of really big hives come back from almonds, and we just could not keep up with the swarms. We, we would take two four frame nukes out of a hive, out of a double deep, we take two four frame nukes out of it. No reason that they should have swarmed. They had plenty of drawn comb in it. They were not nearly big enough to swarm and they would swarm anyway. And we caught some of the most monstrous size swarms. I can think of at least six swarms that we caught that when you put them in two deep boxes, they were overcrowded. Wow. I've never seen such swarm. And I, I don't know if everybody was that way or if it was just my good fortune to have that. But uh, I guess the good side of that was that it didn't really, it didn't really take away from the hives that they swarmed out of. That we didn't really lose that many hives from swarming, uh, and we gained a lot of, we gained a lot of hives. We gained probably 45 hives from just from our bees. That was that was bees. Got, I've heard a lot of people say, well, uh, I caught 15 swarms, but none of them were from my bees. Well, <laughs> we caught about 45, and every one of them was from our bees. <laughs> we, we would be standing out in the middle of the bee yard, because there, there's uh, 280 hives out there. We'd be standing out in the middle of the bee yard saying, there went one, and that one over there is about to swarm. <laughs> <laughs> The funny part of it is that swarms tend to go to the same places over and over and over. And there was one plum tree that uh, is in a little fruit, little miniature fruit orchard that we have behind our house that uh, I told my wife that that plum tree was the most valuable bush that we had in our garden because uh, it had produced at least 11 swarms that wow. lit in that plum tree and it's about maybe 10 feet high at the tallest and it kind of spreads out they were easy to catch and uh i caught them and put them in nuke boxes they wound up going being sold as nukes eventually just i mean that was a very productive little plum tree <laughs> we had we had uh, five other trees that Every swarm we caught come from one of those six trees. Outstanding. Do yeah, you... it's one word for it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if anybody asks me to speak on how to keep bees from swarming, that'll be a pretty short speech, you know. You know but don't listen to me, whatever you do. Mine swarmed prolifically this year. But I've talked to other beekeepers in our area, and everybody's everybody has experienced a, a pretty big swarming season this year. I'm no exception either. <laughs> um, do you do you have any experience with uh, instrumental insemination? Uh, I have enough experience with instrumental insemination to know that I am not any good at it. Uh, 
yeah, I, I have, I have had some experience with it. And I know some guys that are really good at instrumental insemination and, uh, they tried to teach me how to do it. And, uh, they left here needing a therapist. <laughs> but I just was not a good student at it. I've got the equipment for it, but, uh, I think maybe the whole time that I'm doing it, I'm thinking they do this on their own way better than I do it. And I'm just not that, uh, I guess I'm not that invested in it would be the best way to say. I can see the benefit in it though. Super, super. Do we have another question from our audience? Hi, Dave. All can right, you, go ahead, Tony. Uh, can't you just talk about medications, breed breaks? This year, I've done breed breaks in the spring. Uh, I let them raise their own queen in, in the parent colony put the old queen over into a nook or a split. <clears throat> Do you think doing brood breaks along with medications will keep your mat threshold at a livable, uh, a livable down side. I, I think, uh, yeah, I think I think it would. Um, you know, a limit limited medication and brood breaks. I, I think um, the brood break is uh, more beneficial than than it seems like it would be. I mean, it uh, just on just on the surface of it it looks like a brood break might help a little bit but it, you know that's not not that big of a deal uh, but actually a brood break makes a pretty big difference in uh, not just in mites but also in virus transmission right. because you're, you're stopping the host and uh, bacterial diseases you stop the host and mm -hmm. the pest kind of stops too you know, if, if it's real persistent. So the, the brood break makes a pretty a pretty big difference. And then using some medication uh, on top of that, wow. it, it's a pretty good it's a pretty good mite control and virus control plan. Right. As of right now, I'm doing brood breaks, April virus strip. And then in the fall, when the brood cycles down, I'm treating with oxalic acid November, once a month, in November, December, January, and February. What do you think? Does that sound like a pretty good plan? Yeah, it sounds like a pretty good plan. Uh, most mostly because that you're getting a good you're getting a good clean hive going into the fall. By right. The brood break and the amitraz, you're getting a good clean hive going into the fall, and then the oxalic is is just kind of cleaning up the the stray mites that you have, and right. it, by having that good break, you're stopping a lot of the virus transmission that's that would happen, you know, it's almost like what we've been experiencing, you know, all this stuff about social distancing and no big yeah. crowds and all that. The bigger wow. the, the bigger the population in a hive, the faster mm -hmm. the transmission of viruses in the hive. Yeah, I agree. And if you can knock those mites down and break mm -hmm. the brood cycle and when the when the hive is at its largest population, which is July. Mm -hmm. uh, July and August is the largest population normally of the hive. If right. you can do that, if, if you can do that, then you can use cleanups like your oxalic acid later right. and 
You don't mm -hmm. ever let the viruses get ahead of you that right. way. Right. Right. Well, uh, in the parent colony, we've been, well, we pulled the old queen out and put her in a, a split or a nook. We've been letting them raise a queen. And so far, we've had, even with this wet weather, we've had uh, four out of 20 that didn't, the queens didn't make it back. Yeah. Uh, but I worry about the downtime between raising a queen and getting that queen back in, you're losing what a month? Yeah, you you lose a month easily, easily a yeah. month. Uh, yeah. That's not really that big of a deal at this time of year, but for those hives that the queen don't come back to, you've almost got to put a mated queen in there. Right. Well, now we done hive. it. We done this in early spring, like first of March on into April. Uh, but I I tend to uh, worry about the downtime, getting that queen mated and getting that hive ready for honey supers. Uh, what I'm thinking is maybe buy a queen where I pull the old queen out, would I get enough of root break by installing a cage queen into the parent colony to, to keep the viruses and the mites down. Well, if you're going to do it that way and you were wanting to uh, try to try to give enough of a brood break, break to make a difference, you would want to pull your old queen and uh, out of the out of the parent colony. You want to pull her and, and when you're with your split leave it queenless for a week and go back in and then cut the queen cells out, then put put uh, your mated queen in there. Right. And that that would, uh, that within three days, she's going to be released. And, you know, within a couple more right. days, she'll be laying eggs. So you've right. got your, you've got your good brood break there, but you're also still two weeks ahead of what you would have been. Right. Well, that's what I'm, I'm looking at, of course, I know uh, people don't like to spend the money for the queens, like you said earlier, 20 or $25 versus four or five pounds of honey plus three or four more frames to brood, yep. whereas in a month, you're going to be about breathless yep. and, and behind the eight ball as far as new bees being ready for the honey fly. Yeah, you, you'll be you'll be catching up, playing catch up the rest of the year with a high uh, set. Well, uh, if you do let them raise their own queen, yeah. You're playing catch up the whole rest of yep. the year. Yeah. Uh, but as far as raising queens, this year, in my opinion, has been the worst weather I've ever seen about raising your own queen. Yeah, we we usually we usually run about seventy to eighty percent success in getting virgins back to mating new mated and this year we've been at about 60. so it, it's been it's been that way all over Kent, um how many splits do you make in a typical year and how do you do it that's a question submitted from our membership 
I make about uh, I make up about somewhere around eight to nine hundred nukes a year, which is the same as a split. I mean, I'm just splitting them in a smaller box, but I, I make up uh, eight to nine hundred nukes a year. And my favorite way to do it is to go to a bee yard in the afternoon and shake all the bees down into the bottom box and take frames of brood and take all but about two frames of brood, leave two frames of brood in the bottom box with the rest empty frame, shake all the bees into the bottom box, put a queen excluder over it, and then put all that brood in another box on top of the queen excluder and do all the hives in that whole yard that way. So you know you got the queen below the queen excluder. Go back the next day and just pull what you want to out of that second story. It makes it makes real quick work. It makes a really a really bad job that first evening, first afternoon. I mean, they're gonna hate you, or they're gonna treat you really mean. But uh, the next day is really simple and goes really fast. And uh, you don't have to look for the queen that way. And you almost never get a queen. When you do get a queen, it's because I had a box that had a bunch of holes in it and she was out flying around after I shook the bees out. She managed to crawl up, go in the top box, but you'd almost never get a queen in your nukes or in your splits. And it's uh, it's just easy to, easy to do that way. The only downside is you gotta have two or 300 queen excluders. And you got to, you got to endure the wrath of the bees for one afternoon. To do that. Well, it, it, it's not really it's not really that much trouble to make uh, 150 180 splits in a day doing it that way you spend one afternoon shaking them down the next after or next morning you spend making up you know just pulling pulling the frames out putting them in the box and then that afternoon you go to a different bee yard and shake another bee yard down I think that's something I'm going to employ this week. I've got a um, a Ginger or Mary Ann question for you here. All right. Um, I like them both. <laughs> do you use full <laughs> wax or plastic? In any opinion on which is best? Um, bees like wax better, but I like plastic better. And I, I use the double or triple dip acorn frames. Yeah. And uh, Man Lake also makes a really good frame that's comparable to an acorn frame. Now, there, there are new frames that they make with their own mold are, are comparable. But uh, I use at least a double dip or a triple, or a triple wax dip, and the bees draw them out uh, really well. But put them on when there's a honey flow, or you'll absolutely hate them. Now, the wax. Bees like the wax better, but if you put on wax foundation when there's not a honey flow and there's not, and you know, the honey flow don't start for two or three weeks, they're likely to eat it up. And, you know, they, of course, they won't eat the plastic up, but they'll eat the wax off the plastic, and then they won't ever do anything with it other than hang a parallel comb off of it, which is aggravating. You can never find the queen in that. But uh, uh, I prefer the what. The waxed plastic but if you just have a few hives just use beeswax foundation uh, ripple wired foundation cross wire it for it to stay in there straight I mean if you if you don't have until you get 50 or 60 hives uh, I'd recommend just use the use the wax foundation the bees like it better okay uh, do you routinely routinely use pollen patties? Um, I routinely feed pollen substitute. I don't very often use pollen patties. Uh, what I use pollen patties on are uh, cell builders. When I'm when I have a cell builder, when I'm raising queens, I'll use a pollen patty on those. But uh, I do keep pollen substitute out in bee yards nearly all the time so that uh, I, I just I've gotten I've gotten snake bit before by letting hives run out of food 
either letting them run out of uh, syrup or letting them run out of, of protein. And either one of them is just as bad. You can have a hive that, that's hauling in nectar by the bucket loads, but if they don't have protein, the queen's going to quit laying. And it's just as bad. So I, I keep, uh, I keep pollen substitute out for the bees nearly all the time as a free choice. And I, I put it in the five gallon bucket and stand two pallets up, solid pallets for that the rain can't get in, stand them up like a teepee and let the bees have at it. And a, a big bee yard, 200, 240 hives, 200, you know, 240, 252 hives, will eat a five gallon bucket in a day. Wow. Well, let's combine a couple of questions here. Um, anything wrong with setting up some mating nukes next to a queen breeder, just for the quantity and quality of the drones in the area? Well, if, if you set your mating nukes close to your queen breeder, um, the drones that they mate with are not gonna be from that bee yard. So they're going to fly outside the perimeter of their foraging area to find the drone yard. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, if you, I'll, I'll use this as an example. Uh, I got some bees from a beekeeper friend of mine a few years ago that he had a, a real bargain on uh, 48 hives. And he, he said, it's the last ones I've got to sell and I'll sell them to you for what I've got in them. I said, oh, okay. Cause he usually has pretty good bees. So I bought them and uh, those were the craziest bees that I ever had in my life. And if they weren't Africanized, they were good fakes, you know, but, uh, uh, my wife hated my guts for it, but I left them right here at the house, right behind my house, because that's where our mating yard was. And she said, why do you want to keep those mean bees? I have to wear a bee suit just to mow the yard. Yeah, I know. Uh, glad you're mowing the yard, you know, but uh, not me. I told her, I said, I keep those mean bees here because I don't want those drones mating with our queen. And whatever drones are in the yard where your mating yard is, they're, they're not going to be the ones that are mating with your queens more than likely. Uh, your queen, your virgins are going to fly outside the radius of the foraging radius to find a drone yard. So it's okay. You know, it depends on what, what you want your queens mated with. If you want your queens mated, you want the line breed or that your queens are mated with uh, the same stock that you grafted from then you need to move your mating yard half a mile away and uh, move it in a half a mile in the flying direction of you know the direction all the bees are flying move it a half mile or so away and then you got a pretty good chance of mating with the same bees that you grafted from but if you don't want them to mate with what you grafted from put them right there in the same yard so there's nothing wrong with it just depending on what you want Okay. Um, how can you tell the difference between a virgin queen and a mated queen? I imagine that's the size. And um, are well, all swarms yes. one or the other? Uh, well, it the size of a queen is has a lot to do with how well they were fed. And if you if a cell builder is fed really well or if the if the bees have have really fed the that queen larva really well when she comes out as a virgin when she emerges as a virgin her abdomen may be almost as big as, or may be as big as some mated queen and it's kind of hard to tell whether she's a virgin or whether she's a mated queen but now some virgins will have a have kind of a almost a heart-shaped abdomen, you know, and it, it'll be, it won't look, they won't look at all like a mated queen. And as they start producing eggs and producing brood, their abdomen lengthens out and kind of, kind of straightens out the way it, you would think a queen would look. So just to look at a queen 
some of them you can tell, yeah, that's a virgin. You know, if, if the abdomen, abdomen is uh, big on the thorax end and tapers really quick toward the, toward the uh, ovipositor end, that's probably a virgin. But some, the, the abdomen is going to look almost like a, almost like a mated queen. Uh, one fairly good indication that it's a virgin queen is if their thorax is really fuzzy. If there's a lot of fresh hair and light colored hair on their thorax and between their thorax and their head, she's probably a virgin because a queen that has been mated and it has been laying, the bees are going to pull most of that hair off of her thorax, licking, licking the pheromone off of her, off of her abdomen and uh, crawling all over. and uh, the mated queen is not going to have a very fuzzy thorax if she's been if she's been uh, in the hive very long. So that I mean that's one way you can kind of tell. Interesting. Um, how uh, one one uh, participant's having trouble with wax moths. He says, "How would you suggest a small scale keeper uh, store drawn comb?" <laughs> uh, well. You got enough freezer space, put it in the freezer. He he says he doesn't have one, so <laughs> well that then that's off the table there. Um, I've heard I've heard people talk about the different ways of storing drawn comb that uh, would keep wax moths from uh, damaging it. And I've never been that big of a fan of putting it putting it in a plastic garbage bag and putting menthol or putting uh, moth crystals on it because I always forget to check and put new moth crystals on it and they evaporate and the moths come out anyway and eat it eat it up anyway and have gone to that trouble and hadn't accomplished anything other than taking up room in the garage but uh, one one method that uh, a beekeeper in my area uses and he he's does pretty good at, at keeping wax moths out of his comb is that uh, he takes a bug light and he, he stores his comb in a, a little shed that he's got and uh, he hung some black plastic up to make it make it dark around where he hold, where he stored his comb which is counterintuitive I mean you don't yeah. want it dark where wax moths can get in there because that's what they like but he hangs a bug light up in there and uh, all the wax moths go to the bug light, evidently. And he, he says he's had really good success keeping wax moths out of his out of his drawn comb doing that. I was I know you were saying bug light, but I was hearing bud light, and I think they would bud go to either one. <laughs> well, that too. I mean, <laughs> he uses the bud light and then uh, kills the wax moths with a bug light. <laughs> um, let's see. Anyone else? Okay, here's one. Um, I have a medium super just about full. Can I put a deep on or do I need to put it under the medium super? I guess talk about on top or underneath. Well, I'm pretty lazy about stuff like that. I just put them on top. Uh, a lot of people like to bottom, it's called bottom supering when you put them underneath and a lot of people like to do that. And the thing is that if, if there happens to be any brood up there, they'll make a queen up there. In the if you separate a little brood from the queen by the distance of the deep super, they'll make a queen up there. But uh, and that won't be something that you want to happen. But I've seen I've seen it work pretty well to bottom super, and I've also seen it work for that uh, you bottom super, and the bees wind up just moving the honey down from the top super down into the bottom, and when the honey flow would stop, they move it down closer to the brood nest. 
So I, I think it's just kind of a choose your poison kind of thing and being lazy. Uh, I just choose to put it on top. Understood. Um, here's a good question from a, from a beginner. It says, what advice do you have from someone new uh, as to the best location uh, regards to their yard or pasture be to put the hive or where not to put the hive? Well, um, it's best to, it's best if the front door to the hive faces east or southeast so that uh, you you want the sun hitting the front of the hive as soon as possible after the, after it gets light. You want light going in the front of the hive as early in the day as possible. And the bees will work a lot better. Uh, full sun is always better than than full shade. You know, shade is like plastic. You know, plastic's good for beekeepers, bad for bees. Shade is good for beekeepers, not so good for bees. Uh, put them in full sun if if you if you can, because small hive beetles won't won't bother them as badly in full sun, and face them east or southeast where they get the where they get the sun in the front door as early as possible. And with all that being said, you know, bees live in the middle of the woods just like they do on the outside of it. So if you don't have any other place to put them, try to put them in the sunniest place that you can where they're gonna get the most sunlight. And I mean, that's, sometimes you just don't have that big of a choice. You want a water source fairly close to them, hopefully not your neighbor's pool. Uh, if your neighbor has a swimming pool, especially a saltwater pool, give the bees a water source that, and put a little bit of mineral in it or mineral salt or something like that in it so that they will find that water source and, and don't ever let it run dry. If your neighbor has a saltwater pool, make sure that they find your water before they find your neighbor's pool and don't ever let it run dry and you'll keep good neighbors. My girlfriend heard that question and she sent me a text to answer it. She just got stung this last week. So she said, the best place for hives is hell. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you well, ever- there's days, I, there's days that I would agree with that. <laughs> do you ever buy package bees? Do I ever buy package bees? Yeah, I've, I've, I've bought package bees before. I, I didn't buy any this year, but uh, I commonly buy 20, 25 packages every year. And uh, most of the reason that I buy packages is demonstrating to people how to put packages in. <laughs> but but uh, sometimes I buy packages just to, uh, just to make a sale builder. And I'll, I'll shake three, three packages into a into a five frame nuke and I'll make a cell builder with them. And you know that's sometimes I do that. And I also gain three queens at the same time. So absolutely. I do yeah. buy packages. I I mean I I'm not a great fan of packages, but uh, I buy them and I shake some packages too. So but I shake packages later and I buy early, real early packages when I buy them. Florida packages? Uh, yeah, usually. Okay. Usually because I'm, I'm not planning on using them to raise queens off of. Right. I don't, right. I don't mind using them to make queen cells, but uh, I'm not breeding from them. Do you um, utilize drone frames the green frames in your varroa control and do you find that effective it is it is fairly effective if you're uh if you're really uh responsible i guess if you're on the spot about uh taking care of them and getting those drone that drone comb out at the right time uh it is an it's another tool in the toolbox for varroa control without using chemicals, but uh, uh, you may as well get used to having to use something, some kind of medication, even if it's not, even if it's not a very toxic medication. But uh, it is a, it is a useful tool, and 
I have used drone comb in the past just to see what difference it would make in hives. And uh, it, it's just a little bit too labor intensive for, for what we do. It don't fit our, it don't fit our management uh, with, with our bees just because it's, it is labor intensive. It takes, uh, takes too much time to pull drone comb and freeze it and put it back in and all that. But uh, for for uh, somebody with few hives, it, it's it's something to use. Breaking the brood cycle, using drone comb as a as a trap, a varroa trap, and then some kind of minimal uh, minimal medication treatment. That all of that might you might be able to combine all that and uh, do a pretty good job of varroa and virus control. Here's another question from our membership. What kind of protection do you use when you work with your bees? I believe they're talking about um, gloves and personal protection equipment. Well, it depends on what I'm doing. If I'm shaking bees down in the afternoon to make nukes the next morning, uh, I use a full suit. And uh, if you want to go to the bee yard and have the least chance of getting stung, regardless of what you're doing with your bees, uh, get a pair of gum boots or rubber boots and a full bee suit and put your uh, put your boots on over your bee suit and uh, wear a pair of uh, rubber gloves and the, the kind that you can actually feel through and pull your suit up over the gloves and tie it down on your gloves and not much chance you're going to get, you're not going to get really lit up like you would uh, if they get up inside your veil or something. And they're not going to get up your breeches leg, which is very unnerving. But uh, uh, that if I'm, if I'm shaking bees down to make nukes the next morning, that's what I'm wearing. I'm wearing uh, rubber gloves, full suit, gum boots. And uh, I go back the next day and most of the time, I'll just have on uh, just ha have on a jacket, a, b a bee jacket, uh, with a hooded veil on it. And most of the time, I don't even wear gloves. The second day when I go back, when I'm just pulling the frames to put in put in nuke boxes, because I'm also usually handling queens, and uh, I don't need gloves on. But you've got a whole different class of bees and a whole different situation on that next morning versus when you're shaking all the bees down. And you don't need that much uh, that much protective gear. But I have a full suit and I have a jacket. And if I'm if I'm grafting queens or checking mating nukes, a lot of times I won't wear any veil. And so if I wear a veil at all, it's just a hat with a with a a bug veil over it. But you need to you need to understand what you're doing in the bees to know whether or not you're going to need a lot of protective gear or not. There's no way I would wear just a veil and uh, shorts and a t-shirt with no gloves or <laughs> anything like that, shaking bees down to make nukes. So that that wouldn't that wouldn't be a good thing to do. Super. Okay, do we have any more questions from the audience here before we wrap things up? Uh, Howard, I've got a question. Go ahead, Howard. Uh, Kent, yeah. at, what, at what criteria do you use for discarding your brood combs when you determine that they're too old to be continued to be used? And also a related question, when you have colonies that uh, died out during the winter, uh, how long will that pollen that's stored in those combs still be a viable uh, pollen for the bees? Well, as far as evaluating brood comb, uh, brood comb will eventually get, uh, it will eventually get so small that the queen can't get her abdomen in the cells. And it will look round. It won't have any, it, it won't have any uh, definition to the cells, they won't look hexagon anymore. They'll look round. And when I when I begin to see 
cells and, and that will happen along the bottom of the frame before it happens anywhere else on the frame. The first place you're going to see those round looking cells will be right along the bottom of the frame, maybe in the corners of the bottom corners of the frame. And when I begin to see those round looking cells, regardless of what the rest of the frame looks like, I know it's not far behind it. And I'll, uh, I'll change out the comb or change out the frame then. And as far as the pollen being viable, uh, pollen is usually, if it, if it has been fermented, if it has become bee bread, and it's not just pollen, just dry pollen. If it's bee bread, it's viable for about two months. And uh, the bee, there is some nutritional value in it after six months, but it's not really that attractive to bees, but for about two months. If it's dry pollen, it's only viable for about two weeks. So, you know, that, that's why the bees ferment the pollen and turn it into bee bread, so it preserves the amino acid content in the pollen. And it, uh, that's their way of preserving their food source. So a colony, a colony that's died out during the winter has a solid frame almost full of pollen. You would not try to use that the next year. You'd discard that and melt it. Uh, I'm real cheap. So I'm, I would nearly always try to use it. And I will nearly always wish that I had <laughs> Because the bees just don't use it. They, it's almost like they'd rather starve as to eat the stuff. Okay, Tom is a, I think you, Tom went ahead and put the poll up. Um, we had some questions there. Uh, next month, we're bringing Dr. Samuel Ramsey in, and Kent will invite you to that if you'd like to attend. Yeah, I would. I, I like Samuel Ramsey. He's uh, uh, one of the best presentations I've ever seen in my life, beekeeping-wise. Uh, he gave, and it, it was a game-changer real game changer well super we're going to have him on the 14th at 7 p.m eastern time and um august is to be determined we're we're trying to continue our scale of top-notch talent like mr williams and Ms. Trimboli, and um do the best we can there is there any final questions for kent before we go richard okay um Overwintering your nukes, Kent, uh, what's your setup? Uh, one deep, two deeps, deep in a medium? Oh, God. Uh, if I'm overwintering a nuke, I just overwinter a five-frame nuke that's, that's full of bees, and I stack them up right next to one another. And uh, or, that, or that they share, share heat between the nuke walls, and I make sure there's a wind break all the way around them. And uh, I'll set a... I'll set a, a bale of straw or a bale of hay or something like that directly on top of them. And they overwinter just as good as a 10 frame single wheel. Do you employ any of the Mike Palmer resource nukes? Yeah, yeah. I, he, he has, a, he has a, a really nice system for stacking his nukes up and uh, putting, putting, uh, uh, insulation around them and of course he's in northern vermont too but <laughs> it's a little bit more necessary to do that i prefer to winter my nukes in south mississippi but if i'm doing it in west kentucky um, i do it like i said I, I stack them up side by side with the alternating entrances and uh, put a windbreak around them and some insulation on top of them and that they they will winter just make sure they don't run out of food. You put a big sugar patty right on top of them, you don't have to check them but about once a month. Okay, yeah, I, I found myself with a, a dozen or so nukes that I think I'm not gonna be able to get into eight frame or 10 frame hives before winter time and I'm starting to think about how to get them through. Yeah. And well, you're ahead of the game because this is about the time of year that you need to start thinking about winter. One more late question here. It says, uh, what is a herbicide insecticide risk with hives near a, near row cropping? And that'd be like a uh, soybeans or corn. Well, the, the insecticide risk is worse than the herbicide risk. But um, 
where I live, it's common practice now to uh, uh, use an aerial application of an insecticide and fungicide on corn when corn is in the silk stage. And it's pretty hazardous to have your bees sitting next to a cornfield because there's no way to limit the drift uh, with aerial application. It, it's just going to happen. So it, it's not somewhere that you want to have bees in West Kentucky next to a cornfield. If you don't have a choice, which you may not in West Kentucky, we have a lot of corn here. And if you don't have a choice, face the bees away from the cornfield or try to get them on, different, on the other side of a woods lot or other side of a fence row from the cornfield. Uh, beans, about once every three to five years, there'll be some kind of insect pest that they have to spray for. And uh, with, with beans, most of the time it's an aerial application. So anytime there's an aerial application, uh, most of the time those aerial applications have, have an insecticide in them. And it's pretty hazardous to honeybees. You just want them facing away from the crop so you don't get the drift right in the front door. Herbicides don't do any good for the bees but they're not as dangerous as the insecticides are. Uh, herbicides will kill bees that are foraging out in the field if it gets on them, but it's not very seldom that it kills an entire colony. The main thing with herbicides is that they're kind of a multiplier of any other toxic uh, substance that the bees have encountered. A herbicide, especially glyphosate, tends to make it worse. It tends to uh, multiply the hazard to the bees if they bring it back into the hive. But there's not a lot that you can do about it uh, other than move your bees somewhere away from those areas. Okay. Well, this concludes our meeting. We really enjoyed having you and um, appreciate the opportunity for you to present to us once again. And hopefully it won't, won't be long before we can have you back. Sure. I'd love to come back down there in person. Well, great. Good. Hey, Chip, thank you guys for putting this together. It's really great. Thanks. Certainly. All right. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you each next month. And um, you have a good evening. All right. Thanks a lot, Chip. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Well, thanks, Coley. Good morning, welcome. I'm glad you invited me.